Why don't we move to the yes, panel? Yes, let's move over here. So we're going to have an amazing panel. Panel. I would like to invite first, if uh, the microphones are getting ready, then I will very soon invite <laughs> Ms. Carolina Skog, Minister for the Environment from the Ministry for the Environment and Energy. And while she is coming up on stage, give her an applause. Yes. Please. And then we also have the honor of welcoming Professor Johan Rockström from Stockholm Resilience Center, also part of Stockholm University. <laughs> well known, <laughs> Professor. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, we have Ms. Åsa Bjäring, Executive Secretary of the Baltic Sea Commission. Please welcome. Yes. Uh, and in this session, we will try again to see if we have any uh, interesting questions exactly. coming in by Twitter as well. But just to warm you up, um, we talk a lot about the SDGs here, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Agenda 2030. We say it's a transformative agenda. It was a big success when we had the adoption in New York in September 2015. The question is, is it, is it enough? Do you think that this is now the agenda that we can follow uh, and it will take us to sustainability? Or do you think that we still would need something else from the global level? You could say this is the global level. What do you say, Minister Skog? Uh, I've been involved in quite a few processes and like the goals, so it's really... Something Sorry, is something wrong, no problem here. No? Yes. Yep. No. no, thank you. <laughs> Starting over again. Uh, I was saying, I've been involved quite a few times in writing goals for different organizations. Uh, and it is a very difficult task. And I am immensely impressed by the work that is behind the global development goals. Uh, and from my point of view, it's a really functional framework for policy development on national level as well on, as local level. I'm just th thinking, uh, you know, the Swedish government has uh, already started uh, an immense, impressive work on this and is moving strongly ahead. Mm. And I'm thinking about the Oceans Conference, Our Ocean, Our Future, which is organized by the United Nations headquarters, where Fiji and Sweden has taken the lead. Yes. Um, why? why did the Swedish government actually sort of act so quickly upon this goal? What was the reasons? Uh, the aim of our government is to take a global leadership role uh, in the implementation uh, of the SDGs. And to do so, we've been starting out focusing on implementation from one starting point in one goal, the goal 14. Uh, and the reason for picking that goal is that we see it as crucial to also spur the different uh, work on different other, other possibilities and areas. There is no way we can fight pollution, uh, poverty, if we, doesn't, if we don't save our seas. Seas are crucial for food, for jobs, uh, and for the health of people all over the world. And it's closely interlinked, interlinked to all the other goals. So we've chosen goal 14 to set a, set a standard on how to implement one goal and how to interlinked with the other goals. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating. I mean, I know you've had the pre-meeting in uh, February now in mm. New York, and now it's coming up very soon in June. It is coming and up very soon. And you're doing soon. a lot of preparatory work, of course, in head of this conference. We have uh, intense work uh, right now, but the prep meet was uh, work going really, really well, and we were enthusiastic, and we're looking forward to organizations, countries, cities coming to New York, pledge their part of the action plan to implement uh, the, this important goal. So, speaking of pledging, how can then science, Professor Rockström, how can science contribute to the SDGs? I mean, you have already contributed, I know that, but what is the role? Where is science most needed in this process? Mm. Yeah, let, let me start by giving Kalina support that um, <clears throat> there is a very strong scientific support to the whole Sustainable Development Goals agenda if we can keep them together as one package. This is the social ecological roadmap for humanity on planet Earth. And the Baltic Sea is right at the center there. And I think it's really important to, to remind ourselves, and I, I feel personally that this gives 
a scientific agenda and an agenda for innovation and business and civil society. Remember that SDG 14 on oceans has a whole set of targets. But you know, target one is that by 2025, I mean, that's in eight years' time, we're supposed to prevent and significantly reduce all marine pollution, particularly from land-based activities, which is 80% of the problem in the Baltic Sea, and halt all marine debris, which Lena Eck was talking about, and nutrient loading. This is in eight years' time. That is an agenda for change. The second target is by 2020, three years' time, to have sustainable stewardship of all our coastal regions and marine systems in the world and strengthen the resilience. And science has showed very clearly that the Baltic Sea went over one tipping point in the 1950s, which was the nutrient overloading, the nutrient you know, poor, the oligotroph, to the nutrient-rich state. And in the late 1980s, because of cod overfishing, we tipped over into the sprat explosion we have today, which has led to, as we know, almost 30% of anoxic dead zones. So, of course, the science is absolutely fundamental to help the diagnostics, but also to help the solutions. I know Ragnar Elmgen and others are here showing on the innovation side how this can be solved in the future. Target three, in three years' time, in three years' time, end overfishing. <laughs> end overfishing. We know that 80% of the seas in the European Union are overfished, again backed by the scientific diagnostic. And finally, as if this was not enough, in three years' time, halt all subsidies for overfishing and overcapacity in the fishing industry. So, so this is a roadmap for a transformation to a desirable future. And, and to close, let's just say scientifically, we showed just a few years back, inspired by Lena Eck, by the way, when we did the Baltic Stern analysis, which was kind of a new uh, climate economy version for the Baltic Sea, showing that you know, the willingness to pay in the nine riparian states in the Baltic Sea is extraordinary. And the Swedes are highest. Actually, our willingness to pay is per capita 1,000 Swedish krona, 100 euros per person per year. This translates to 40 billion or 5 billion euros in investment per year to save the Baltic. So don't ever get cheated by alternative facts. <laughs> People want to save the Baltic. Lena is right. This is a fundamental core of our identity, mm. that we have a clean, healthy Baltic. It's part of value. I mean, the reason why we can market Briggen Trikroner is that there's something to sail in. And that Baltic is part of our identity and culture. It's invaluable, actually. So there's scientific support along the diagnostic, the value chain, and solutions. So would you agree, Mrs. Piaring? I mean, you represent here the um, uh, CPMR, Baltic Sea Commission. You've been bringing regional actors together for a long time. Would you, would you agree with Professor Rockström saying that sort of change is possible and there's a willingness to change? Yes. Uh, I do believe, uh, but uh, on that, and I would say that I, I've, I hear that from the political level all around the Baltic Sea. So I work in Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Germany, and to some extent as well, my reality is that we feel in the Baltic Sea Commission and, and, and with the Baltic actors and regional stakeholders that we want to push it further than what we have from the EO directives for maritime spatial planning, for example, etc. So in that sense, yes, um, I do. <laughs> The question, it's an interesting question because you're highlighting the fact that there are good examples in the Baltic Sea region about collaboration, the fact that there is a willingness to pay. Uh, but of course, we, also, we are also aware of the fact that the Baltic Sea is the most polluted inland water in the world, basically. So when we are coming to New York to the, co to the conference there, we, we are going to focus on partnerships, uh, it's going to focus on, on uh, stakeholder engagements, it's going to be voluntary commitments. It's, about, it's going to be about highlighting positive examples. Can you just each give us one example where you think the Baltic Sea region is at the forefront? Is, where, where is the one example you would highlight to bring to the Ocean uh, Conference where you would say, we are at the forefront? Karina, should you stop? Yeah, one, there's one very obvious one. Uh, the, uh, having a regional sea convention uh, in the Baltic Sea uh, is unique in the terms that we were the first one. Helcom has been acting now in 40 years and has developed uh, a cooperation a mode of cooperation that is a standard uh, for the world. Uh, and from the governance side, this will be one of the main examples that we are bringing to New York. Okay. What's that? 
Well, coming from the regional side, I would say that even if we're not good enough on multi-level stakeholder cooperation and that kind of partnerships, I think that for the world we have come quite far. Uh, and I think that we can push this even more on the SDG agenda. Uh, the, the regional authorities and majorly the municipality authorities, uh, together with some of the governments, really pushed for the territorial dimension here. And I would say that the governments of the Baltic Sea are also very open and understanding that it looks different depending on where you live. Uh, and that we face different challenges within the countries, within the whole Baltic Sea region as such, and that we need to uh, elaborate on partnerships that are closer to the citizens or the real pro problems uh, mm. in that sense. So the multi-level perspective, uh, I think we, we, we are on our track there. Mm. And Johan, what do you say? There, there are many candidates, and I, and I, I, I would totally agree with, with Carolina that HELCOM and the intergovernmental model for the nine riparian states in Baltic Sea mm. for collaboration is, is a unique feature. It's a trust-based long term. I think the Baltic Sea Action Plan actually aligns itself very nicely with both science and the SDGs. Our understanding of the value of ecology for human well-being, I think, is also unique, that we can cross sectors between environment, uh, industry, finance, economy, agriculture. But I would, I would pick one a specific one, which is I think we um, in the Baltic Sea have come a long way to understand that we need to close the nutrient loops and that we have both technologies, city planning, understanding sustainable agriculture. We, we're kind of in a circular nutrient mode of thinking across sectors, which I think is we're in no way there yet, but I think it's a really important area that we now need to invest uh, at a large scale. It's no longer only about fisheries and only about debris, but it's also about closing the nitrogen phosphorus loops, and we've understood that and invested for a long time in the Baltic, and I think that's a, that's a key for food security as well. Mm. Yeah. Maybe we should check uh, if yeah, there are check. some tweets uh, coming in. Uh, if um, Mona, are you ready? Uh, any questions coming in there? Hello, <laughs> from Twitter. <laughs> yes, we have a question. Uh, if you get to choose, what would be the single most important piece of legislation that would save the Baltic Sea? Okay, so it's about legislation. So if you can choose something, what would be the single most uh, piece? Karina, uh, you, you have the power. I mean, what <laughs> tomorrow, what would you like to legislate? Uh, I have one idea. Mm. Uh, I don't think it's not, it won't save the Baltic Sea as such, but it's uh, something very doable. How about the vision of a Baltic Sea region free from microplastics in co uh, cosmetics within three years? It's completely doable. Uh, I'm working on a, on a ban, on a Swedish ban on microplastics in cosmetics, and we brought it up uh, at the HELCOM meeting last week and we got positive response from Finland uh, and we will bring this further because uh, if we could unite uh, on one thing very practical and do it quite quickly because as the Crown Princess was mentioned almost 40 tons of microplastics reach, reaches the Baltic Sea every year uh, and we, we can't have it like that and it's completely doable to stop it. What do you say, Johan? I mean, uh, you are a scientist, of course, but if you had a wish list for legislation, uh, also from the experience you have uh, working uh, on the Baltic Sea region, what, what would it be? What, what do you think would be a change maker here? You know, one of the privileges of being a scientist, I can be a bit naive and utopian. I don't a have and to say really anything be you anchored want. in reality. <laughs> so, um, so I, and, and you know, I would actually suggest not to pick one legislation. I think we need something that will affect all the legislation we have, which is a tipping point, which is moving away from our current modus operandum, where everything we do has to fulfill short-term cost-benefit analysis, sammels ekonomiska kalkyler. We always, always measure everything on, can we do something for the environment? Okay, if it also gives us on the short-term good for the economy, for jobs, for growth. I think we simply have to now tip over and recognize it's time to save the Baltic. We have now 10 years. We have the SDG agenda. We have the Paris Climate Agreement. We have the Baltic Sea Action Plan. It's time to do it. It's time to invest in a big way because this gives us long-term 
It's impossible to measure, but it gives us long-term value back. And I think if we could shift over that thinking and not allow, as we do today, um, too many actors always halting different legislations because it doesn't give proof that over the next three years this gives us a payback, that would be the roadmap to, for example, introduce a price on nitrogen, a carbon tax, but now a nitrogen tax, a phosphorus tax, a moratorium on fisheries. You know, some really tough, I know it's difficult, but really <laughs> tough leadership measures that would actually say that we are now going to do it mm -hmm. once and for all. And it will cost us on the short term, and we cannot calculate it back on a, on a social economic spreadsheet, but it will gain our kids and young, you know, future generations. And I think it's time to tip over and allow ourselves to try that. Mm. What, would you agree also? Or, um, well, just I'll allow about the, the governmental level uh, and the parliament to sit on the legislation. But I think uh, on taking concrete action on the sustainable development goals and the Baltic more process oriented, uh, I believe that with the SDG 11 that we have been fighting for from the local and regional authorities side, uh, I think it's quite, it, it could be really good to look upon which data are we using for a long-term analysis uh, and could it be voluntarily from the governmental level to actually say we're not only reporting back on national data but we're actually ensuring uh, that we go down on regional level, not two level as we speak on in the European agenda, etc. And that could be a way of actually seeing, okay, which action can we put in where yeah. and how so it's, not, it's a little bit more um, blurry than concrete action, concrete legislation. But I believe that within the framework that we have right now, we need much more knowledge on what is actually happening locally in the municipalities, in the regions, and on national level. And we have to allow ourselves to know that when Sweden reports in or when Germany reports in, it is very different, or Latvia, Estonia, it's very different if you take the national uh, data and report it in. And if you actually push it so that you report in what is happening locally and regionally, then you kind of provoke or enthusiast and get the local regional authorities much more engaged and active in this. Because I think that we come in with much more po positive enthusiasm uh, when it's about what can we do, how can we contribute. And we, I'm, I'm very confident that the local regional politicians, uh, mayors and regional uh, um, politicians do want to contribute in this. Well, I hear them say every day that this is the key issue uh, in the politics they do. Well, this links very, very well to the next question that came into my mind, uh, Carolina. Um, what can policy and polit pol political processes do to strengthen this local and regional activities? Because I think we do all agree that that's a key factor for getting change actually happening. But how do you see that? What is the role then for the national levels? How can you contribute to this? Yeah, one other thing that happened on the HELCA meeting last week was that they decided to take a more active role on including the local level uh, in the work of the action plan. Uh, and I welcome this uh, decision. Uh, and there is also the process uh, of the EU strategy. Uh, and I do urge any local uh, decision makers being present here to take a part uh, and create common projects within the framework uh, of the strategy. Because uh, that's where I see the action happening, where local uh, leadership comes together and takes place in within uh, a framework uh, of the national and the, uh, also the European uh, network uh, framework, so that uh, the local level can fill the action plans with true action. Because I share uh, the positive view that was expressed by the mayor of Stockholm on the local leadership. Uh, they are the glimpse of hope uh, in today's world. Johanna, if I can go back to, to your comment before, uh, as, you, as you clearly stressed, we need really quite fundamental long-term action. It's almost the same kind of politics that gave us now this uh, framework for, for the climate uh, politics in, in Sweden, where you have broad uh, collaboration across uh, different parties and so on. Um, but at the same time, you also hear that it's the local level, it's really about the people and so on. If you look at us as scientific organizations and the work that you do, how do you think we can better connect the science 
that, that you are talking about, the fact that we have all this knowledge with the local level. Because what, when you say moratorium on fisheries and so on, this of course can feel quite threatening still mm. to short-term job creation, etc., etc. What, what can science do to also be a bridge between policy and the local level in that case? Mm. No, actually, I, I would argue that science has come quite a long way here. And um, you know, there's so much evidence behind the following conclusion that local action is, is the pathway to solution, but there's no local action that can succeed disconnected from other scales. We are today in the Anthropocene. We are affecting, you know, Kalmar or Öresund in the Baltic, the Baltic in the Nordic, the Nordic in Europe, Europe in the world. And that these are, you know, completely interdependent systems today that climate change is hitting back on the Baltic as the Baltic hits back through our different life cycle transactions we have in our consumption production patterns. So I think there is a, a very logical relationship for science to make, uh, to help in giving exactly these science-based data and targets and, and, and numbers on how scales interact. But secondly, I think it's important for science to also step out of its normal comfort zone to work not only with diagnostics, but also you know, in dialogue with different stakeholders yeah. as part of the scientific, you know, what we call transdisciplinary research, where you have business, civil society, scientists, actors working on solutions on the ground. And I think Astrid Sörbevirin, you know, proclaimed that from Stockholm University very clearly, and the Baltic Sea Center with Tina Elving and the colleagues are really stepping out of its comfort zone from academia to work with integrated solutions where science interacts with, um, with other stakeholders. I think, there's a, I think we've come a long way to really do what what we're kind of visioning here. So I keep hearing from all three of you sort of three buzzwords really. Leadership, action, and connecting scales. Mm. I mean, think about this. W would you like to send another key words with us for the rest of the Congress? You can think about this for a minute or two while we ask if there are any more Twitter questions coming in. Or would you like to add some questions to the panel here? I look a bit confused, so we'll just start We're talking while they check it up. Are there other things that we should set up? Or are you having something there? Uh, we do have another question here. Uh, we, uh, people are asking about the SDGs, uh, the goals that we have to achieve, and uh, they are a bit broad, as they are right now. And people are wondering what the plan is to break them down into more concrete uh, pieces to actually work with in daily life. Okay, so a question about uh, breaking down the sort of overarching SDGs to a more local national level. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah, can Please. Uh, we have an extensive work going on now in Sweden. We have given the tasks for every individual agency within our a governmental system to, within their own framework, make the, uh, break down the SDGs. What do, does it mean for their organization, their current work? Because I, I strongly believe that the breaking down must be in a specific context. How do we relate? What do we do tomorrow? How does it relate to the SDGs? And I have experience uh, from doing this also on the local level. Before I became a minister, I was a deputy mayor in the city of Malmö. Uh, and there we decided in the city board to do the exactly the same thing, to break down the SDGs to our place on the earth. How does it relate to the, uh, to the global goals? And my experience is, is that taking the global goal as a way of really thinking big in, uh, on when also working from the local position is a good way of finding path to the futures. And coming close to questions that has seen very, really, really, really difficult. Um, and I also would like to mention one work that I also started when I was a deputy mayor that is connected to what Joen is saying, bringing scientists out of, of the labs, uh, something that's really close to my heart, with, which is marine education. And I will be opening this autumn a center for marine education in Malmö where you have young scientists going out to the lab, onto the water together with local children, teaching them very practically about the ocean, about the water, about the marine life. I think that's one of the key issues to invest in the future and a 
deeper, uh, invest in our children for them to have a deeper understanding uh, of what's happening beneath the ocean. Because one of the reasons that policy is coming late is actually lack of knowledge on the waters and on the seas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to compliment, uh, I, I, I fully agree on, uh, you know, as, as a member of the Swedish delegation 2030, it's one of the big tasks to translate the SDGs now to a Swedish, Swedish master plan. Not only the vision for Sweden, how does Sweden look like when we in 2030 have delivered on all the SDGs, but also the roadmap to get there. But let me just share two, two I think, key issues here. One is the very simple fact. I, I, don't, I don't agree that they are actually so um, abstract. I mean, I, I read from the target list here. I can tell you goal two has been wrongly presented as the goal on hunger. It's not at all a goal on hunger. It's the goal, which is the General Assembly has stated, the goal on healthy and sustainable diets for all human beings on Earth and has targets on health and sustainability for diets and food systems. It is the roadmap for a transformation to sustainable agriculture in the Baltic region. It is, it is not only about eradicating hunger for the poorest in the world. Mm -hmm. So that's just key message one. But the second is that, um, you know, the 17 goals are universal for every country in the world and they are to be held together. That's why the logotype is this round circle. So mm -hmm. we've actually scientifically even translated them to what we call the wedding cake. And the wedding cake is now actually getting a little bit more movement in the world, which is quite um, satisfying for academic organizations, which at the bottom, the big part of the cake, are the four you know, scientifically based environmental goals. The ocean goal, the biodiversity goal, the freshwater goal, and the climate goal. These are non-negotiable safe operating space points for us to have. The next part of the cake, the social goals. You know, good well-being, equity, education, gender, hunger, all that. And on top, we have a number of goals, which are the tools to succeed. The economic goals, economic growth, innovation, sustainable consumption production. And on top, the real pinnacle you know, on this wedding cake is, of course, governance and partnership, which Helcom is a good example of. So, so it gives us a roadmap of integrated, applied vision for the Baltic and for the world, I think. So it's not, it's not so abstract. I don't know if you agree, Karina, but I think it's, it actually I has a lot agree. of... Yes. Yeah. Also, I, I also agree that it's oh. not uh, abstract. And once you start discussing the, the goals, you can really feel that, okay, this matters for us. Yeah. <laughs> this is within the mandate uh, of what the regions or the municipalities are working on, for yeah. example. Uh, I would say that uh, a, a word that could then be a buzzword in that sense, at least when we look upon it, is now to some extent, these are issues that we have been discussed for a long time. What's new here is the system thinking. Mm. It's the alignment of policy, it's that we say they mm. do belong together, which is your message too in that sense. And I would say, here we need capacity building, capacity building, capacity building. Not information campaigns, I'm very often hearing about information campaigns. I think that we need to build capacity in, in, in getting people in on this. Children mm. in schools, teachers in schools but also policymakers on different uh, levels to understand, okay, what can we do and how can we move? And here I think that, you know, we speak policy alignment very often in the reality of the regional authorities. Policy alignment goes together with funding alignment. And it is quite interesting to see what's happening on the EU level uh, at this moment. We are waiting for a new EU 2020. We're all doing that. And we do not know what will come uh, with this state that our joint cooperation, the EU, is in right now. But it could be very well that the commissioner or, or the, the governments actually say, we're all governments, we all signed the sustainable development goals. And could the continuation of EU 2020, which was a sustainable and competitive agenda in that sense, going very well in the system thinking, but much more detailed and concrete in SDGs 2030 mm. to some extent than what we saw in EU 2020. Right. And if you do that, if you put it as a prerequisite for the regional development funds, like we have smart specialization strategies already with a lot of social innovation happening, with a lot of clean tech uh, action going on. If we align it and push, uh, then, then we give tools as well. And I think that in order to really create action here, we need to see how the policy alignment, how the system thinking will go together with the funding alignment. Excellent. Thank you, Thank you so much. And policy alignment came up, system thinking came up. These are all 
not just buzzwords, they are serious words, uh, that we'll take with us through the conference um, that will hopefully shape a really good outcome of the conference as well. So thank you very much, Carolina, Osa, Johan, for joining us in this short panel. Thank you for the questions coming in on Twitter as well. A warm applaud.